Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Thrive Innovation Series here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Hartnett, CEO and founder of SVG Ventures and Thrive. We're an innovation and investment platform advancing the future of food and agriculture through innovation. And I'm delighted to be joined here today by John Buckley, President and CEO of Wilbur Ellis, and Mike Wilbur, President and CEO of Cavallo Ventures, where we're gonna learn insights from the past 100 years and a sneak peek into the future. So welcome gentlemen, Good to, looking forward to a good discussion. Thanks John. Oh. Next slide, Jess. Uh, you can follow us on, on social media, uh, on Twitter, if you wanna tweet out any particular comments or engage in the conversation, we'd love to hear, hear you and, and, and have you involved. And next slide. We have the innovation series running for the last uh, you know, number of months uh, since we hit the, the pandemic. We have focused our webinar series on the future of the food supply chain from field to fork, as well as addressing the challenges of a feeding growing, growing a population in a sustainable way while dealing with climate change and the impact of gl the global pandemic. We've been discussing key trends, technologies and solutions across the agri-food industry with top CEOs, innovators, entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, we have a great session today lined up with Wilbur Ellis and uh, later on, on November 19th, we're going to have a great conversation with Driscoll Berry's uh, CTO, Scott Comer, and Fenty's founder and CSO, Nate Story. Uh, they had created a great partnership uh, earlier this, this month, and uh, which has resulted in a $140 million investment. And later on in December, we'll have our Australian challenge and our Canadian challenge in January. So make sure you're, you're registering now. Next slide. Our Thrive Accelerator was voted the number one agri-food accelerator in the world last year at the World Agri-Food Summit by AgFunder. We have had some incredible success stories over the past six years, and these companies have created almost $1 billion in value since they've come through the Thrive program. Uh, next slide, Jess. We're now launching our Thrive 7 program. Uh, we launched it last month and we're looking for early stage startups and we would encourage entrepreneurs from all over the world to apply. Our deadline is November 20th, so you've got a couple of weeks to go. So we look forward to kind of getting applications coming in. Next slide. Uh, we've also launched our Thrive Global Challenges for both scale-ups and startups. Uh, these are supporting the key USDA goals as well as the SDG goals. And this year we are doing additional challenges in Africa, Australia, and Canada. So we're really looking forward to seeing a significant number of uh, applicants from, from these countries. And uh, maybe just to give you a glimpse into the challenges, we'll play a little video here and you get a sense of what, what this is all about. And uh, I'd like to announce our Australian judges. Uh, we've got key leaders from some of the biggest uh, corporations and companies in Australia, uh, Costa, Grain Corp, uh, Meat Livestock Australia, LIC, uh, CBH Group, and CSIRO, the national uh, research organization. So we're delighted to have a great group of judges involved. Our next slide is uh, our launch of our, our Canadian challenge. Uh, again, we've got uh, an esteemed group of judges from FCC, uh, CTO Carteva, Trimble, Panasonic, Nutrien, and uh, ourselves, of course, and uh, looking forward to kind of seeing, seeing a great set of companies coming through from Canada. Uh, next slide, Jess. Uh, if you're interested in any of our programs or if you'd like to join, join us, uh, please visit our website 
Uh, we've got some of the biggest corporate names that we work with today in the industry. And obviously, Wilbur Ellis has been a great partner of ours for the last you know, four years. And uh, it's been great to be able to work with them in terms of their innovation strategy and growth strategy uh, along the way. Next slide. So we have a, quite a, a diverse group of people from all over the world uh, today. Um, I think we've had over 400 registrations and uh, people from 34 countries and, and lo looks like 32 states. So uh, uh, quite, quite a big turnout today, even though we're dealing with all this political uh, counting going on. And this is going to be a great break from all the polit political uh, maneuvers. Uh, next slide, Jess. We're launching a, a poll right now. So you've, we've got two questions and please start filling in the poll now. We, we'd like to be able to comment on, on, your, uh, on your results. Uh, we're focusing on, on a digital poll and also on the adoption challenges uh, of technologies in the, in the farm. So please, uh, please start voting now. Thank you. And next slide. Also, if you want to join the conversation, if you want to engage with, with John or Mike, ask them any specific questions around the business, where things are going, et cetera, uh, please you know, submit your Q&A. Please do it now. Uh, we, and you can upvote you know, particular questions if you like somebody else's question better than yours or, or, or vice versa. So uh, we'd love to uh, have you engage in the conversation. So next slide. So great to have uh, John and Mike here today. These are the leaders of Wilbur Ellis and Cavallo Ventures. And um, this past year, Wilbur, Wilbur Ellis launched a year long celebration uh, of its 100th anniversary, which happens on June 29th next year. Celebrating a milestone in the middle of a pandemic is no easy feat, but this is a company that has seen significant good times and tough times over the last hundred years and COVID-19 pandemic is one more challenge to overcome. So we thought we'd share a video from John Thatcher, the executive chairman of Wilbur Ellis Board of Directors and former CEO of the company and grandson of its founder, Brayton Wilbur Sr. John talks about the roots of the company, the values, and it's really a great insight into what has created a, an incredible company that has stood the test of time through various different challenges over the past you know, 100 years. So. Maybe Jess, if you could play the video with John, it'd be great now. I was only nine when my grandfather passed away, but even at that age, I would say he could make quite an impact on me. He wasn't a big guy, he wasn't a tall person, but he's one of those people that just had a tremendous amount of energy. and. He would take that energy and just focus it on you. And I think that it makes you feel special when somebody that you respect, that clearly a lot of people respected, and at nine you're aware of that. I think Brayden Wilbur would be extremely proud of a company that's really his legacy. You know, he built the foundations, but it's really the people along the way that enabled the company to be what it is today. It wasn't some invention. It wasn't somebody had a great idea and we built the company off that idea. It was almost a constant level of innovation for a hundred years with so many people and so many people with a shared sense of values. And, and those values, of course, originated with Brayton. That's what our company is really all about. It's just a group of people continuing to build on what's come before them. Everybody's contributed over so many decades and that legacy just continues to make us stronger. If you make it to 100 years, by definition, that means you have an extremely strong set of values and a shared purpose. When we talk about values, we can really walk the talk. This isn't something that somebody designed for a corporate brochure or a mission statement. I mean, this is who we are. There's nothing debatable. It's, it's us. We've been in San Francisco on the same block of California Street for 100 years. It's amazing. In theory, we could put a headquarters anywhere. And one could argue why San Francisco, given you know, how diverse and geographically diverse our company is, but those are our roots. And that's where we've been. And it's just part of our DNA. Wow, 
that was fantastic and you know very inspirational and uh, incredible to see that you're still headquarters in the city uh, downtown over all these years um, maybe I'd give you a quick intro on John <clears throat> and Mike. Um, John is uh, President CEO of Wilbur Ellis, as I, I'd mentioned. Uh, John has over 30 years experience in business management, engineering, manufacturing, sales and marketing, and having served leadership roles in major companies in the US, Brazil, Mexico. And before joining Wilbur Ellis, uh, John was at Air Liquid, uh, a multi-billion dollar US uh, company, and also held positions in Rom Haas Company Auto Fresh and the Dow Chemical Company. Uh, Mike uh, is president and CEO of Cavalla Ventures. Mike serves uh, on the Wilbur Ellis Board of Directors and leads Cavalla Ventures Wil Wilbur Ellis Venture Capital Arm. Mike guides investments in entrepreneurial enterprises that supports Wilbur Ellis's core business. And in the past, Mike has been in Thailand as country manager for Con Connell and and companies specialities or the company speciality. Uh, a chemicals business in Asia Pacific and corporate vice president in business development in Kavala Ventures. And he's done several acquisitions and investments uh, with dozens of emerging companies uh, and technology. So gentlemen, great to have you here here today. Yeah. And I'm so keen to learn so much about uh, what, you, what you've been doing. Maybe John, if, if, if you don't mind, if I kick it off with you, um, you know, t tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, 100 years is an incredible, you know, duration for any company. But, you know, what is the secret sauce, you know, not just to kind of last in this industry, but to lead in this in industry and, and maybe maybe to frame up the conversation, maybe you, you give us a little bit of an insight and an overview of what Wilbur Ellis is today. Sure. Uh, uh, hey, John, yeah, happy to do it and, and really glad to be here. Uh, it's been a great working relationship we've had with uh, Thrive uh, SVG for the four years you talked about. So it's great to have an opportunity to be here today. Um, yeah, so uh, you may not know this, but we kind of talk about our purpose at Wilbur Ellis is to provide the essentials for the world to thrive. So there's a real, real symbiotic relationship here between us. And, and if you if you uh, remember what you saw in that video, you can tell that's what Wilbur Ellis has done over 100 years and continues to do today. You know, today where we are, multi-billion dollar revenue company, still family owned. Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, and, you know, we've got essentially four, four operating divisions, uh, as well as the Cavallo Ventures uh, venture group that Mike heads and he'll talk about. Uh, those divisions are, you know, certainly of, of most interest probably to the folks here today. In North America, we have uh, you know, an agriculture, a crop agriculture, retailing and wholesale business that operates in the United States primarily. Uh, we have animal nutrition business, which is you know, more of a global footprint, but you know, heavily concentrated in North America, West Canada. <clears throat> um, and that serves uh, livestock, aquaculture, um, and pet uh, as the three platforms that it serves. Um, additionally, we have uh, a specialty chemical manufacturing business in the U.S., which is uh, Nature's, we acquired last year. Uh, but a lot of their, you know, focuses on agriculture as well, which was kind of a the synergistic relationship we saw there. And then finally, and you saw some pictures that say Canel, and you mentioned it as well. We say Canel, Connell is how it's spelled, but we say Canel, uh, which is a specialty chemical and ingredients business. Uh, Mike worked there, as you mentioned, um, that's uh, in, in Asia, primarily in Asia and 18 countries in Asia. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's a very diverse business, but really about providing the essentials of the world to thrive. We're looking at, you know, sustainable businesses that we've got. We really invest in ingredients and in life sciences in Asia, uh, crop agriculture, animal nutrition in the, in the United States and North America. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you probably could glean some of the secret sauce from what you heard from John and saw in that video. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've been there three years now. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have to go back and it's so very fortunate that I'm there while we're celebrating our hundredth anniversary. We're going back and we're kind of spending the time to kind of go through each decade and all employees are trying to understand the roots of the company and how we got to where we are and, and to kind of help you shed, shed some light on the secret sauce, at least my perspective and Mike will probably have other comments to make is, you know, Wilbur Ellis has, has really been great at understanding the markets seeing market dynamics and making good business judgment about how to respond to those and, and, and quite willing and able to make bold moves in that when we see 
uh, markets changing for opportunity and, and to avoid problems. And an example I'll use is, um, you know, in the 50s, Wilbur Ellis was <clears throat> the leader in, you know, fish meal uh, and, uh, and in the business in Canterbury Row in California and Monterey, et cetera, and, and really uh, kind of the top dog there. And you can see uh, from the video, that was the roots of the company in fish meal. So fish meal dominated the company. But, you know, Brayton Wilbur saw that that was, you know, that it was getting fished out in the United States. The industry was moving to Peru. He went and bought as much equipment as he could outside of Wilbur Ellis and took both Wilbur Ellis equipment, stuff he bought, and moved it to Peru and essentially established the fish meal industry in Peru. For a number of years, Wilbur Ellis was the leader in that business there. And then, you know, through just paying attention to what's going on in the marketplace, uh, Brayton saw that probably the government was getting too interested in the business. He decided to sell out. And this was when business we called, you know, Brayton Wilbur, the king of fish meal um, at the time in the 50s, he decided to sell out of that business, diversify with investments in the United States that ultimately led to where we are today. And within a couple of years, the Peruvian government had nationalized the industry. So I think you see several really bold moves there for leadership and, and really getting the company kind of moves mm -hmm. that, uh, that really set the company up for success long term. And so here we are 70 years later, built, you know, living on the foundations, building on the foundations that he established with those decisions back then. You know, and I think we try and, and continue to drive that way. And we've got a family, uh, family shareholders and board of directors very supportive of us making, you know, these bold moves in the industry. Uh, and in the last two years, we and actually we're celebrating the anniversary tomorrow of one of our bold acquisitions where we entered into aquaculture with purchase of Rangan last year, as well as the Natures, which set up this fourth division I mentioned. And then uh, two years ago this month, we acquired Ameripac, which gave us a, a bigger entree into the pet food industry. So I think that's, you know, how I would phrase, you know, one tip from our, our secret sauce is, you know, be willing to you know, pay attention, make sure you know what's going on in your marketplace, be willing to make the bold moves uh, that are required to continue to be successful. Mike, I don't know if you had anything to add on that. Yeah. I John, I think you said it really well, you know, as we look back over a hundred years and we've been doing this by decade, it's really been interesting. But for, for me, you know, I've been here at Wilbur Ellis 23 years and, and grew up really hearing about it around the dinner table and the company has taken risks and not everything's worked out. Uh, but the number of businesses we've been in over the past hundred years has been phenomenal. Uh, and some have led to exactly where we are today. But as I think about the, the secret sauce, you know, as it were, it comes down to a few things. One, you know, John says, understanding the markets, I think it would maybe a little bit differently is really listening to the customers and, and figuring out solutions to their problems. And then really most importantly, uh, it's all about integrity and the ethics of how we do business, you know, across all of our businesses, whether it's in Asia in you know, in Thailand and Vietnam, China, uh, our relationships with our customers generally go on for generations. You know, they're with family businesses in Asia. Uh, they're with growers here in the U S so it's not, we're not looking at doing business with a potato grower for this year. And then, rekindling the relationship next year. It's often multi-generational. And really the key, you know, I think my grandfather used to say, you know, we stand behind our handshakes and we we back our employees when they make commitments. And, you know, we partner with these customers regardless of where they are for a long time. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible, incredible stuff. I mean, it, I mean, ultimately you're serving a customer and having that kind of true north in terms of you know adapting and adjusting, but I think uh, I think maybe the 21st century version of being able to pivot uh, when you see different opportunities or being able to kind of adapt and and take on change. And um, I, I've been just so impressed with just the the kind of values and the culture. You know that that feels to me kind of rings out in terms of what you mentioned there in terms of you know trust integrity. Um, I mean, it's so it's you know it's, it's such an, an integral part of what you guys do, and it's a, it, it obviously has stood the test of time. 
So Mike, you know, Cavalla Ventures, right? So Cavalla Ventures isn't, wasn't around 100 years ago. Uh, so this is a real, uh, you know, uh, you know, a case study in terms of, you know, why, why did you set up Cavallo Ventures or, you know, tell us a little bit about Cavallo and, and, and maybe why it's different than other VCs, you know, there's a lot of VCs out there, but I, I think I, I have a feeling there's some special sauce behind uh, Cavallo. Well, sure. So, you know, it probably looks odd for a hundred year old company to start up a, a corporate VCR, but I think for, for us and, and the family as well, all we've ever done is, is innovate. So this seems like a natural extension of what, what we've always done. And there's a few things that were, were hitting us in, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, one, we saw our customer base being sort of bombarded with technology coming at it from all different areas and, and even our employees and our branches. And more than just wanting to, you know, participate and make a good ROI, we wanted, how could we sort of curate these tech technologies and help find the best solutions and bring them to our employees and to our, our customers. Um, and so that was one of the, the thesis. I mean, our, our branches, you know, particularly after the purchase of Climate Corp, uh, our guys were being overrun in the branches. People were knocking on their doors and it, it was really a distraction. And so how can we bring some organization to it and then partner with the right ones to help them grow? And then the other thing that really had changed was innovation for a long time, we had relied on a lot of our very large multi-billion dollar partners, you know, the, the major chemical suppliers and seed manufacturers for innovation. We had relied on them for new products and new ideas and what's coming out of their labs. But that had really shifted and, you know, innovation was happening elsewhere. But what those innovators lacked was that last mile, that route to market. And if I think just of our, our ag business, you know, we have 30, 35,000 farmer customers that we've known for generations. They, you know, they trust us. So this innovation was happening outside of where we'd seen it traditionally and they were doing a wonderful job, but they lacked that last mile. And so that's where we saw that we could play a role. And I, and I think that's, John, how part of our secret sauce and how we do it differently. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Thirty-five thousand farmer customers. That's that's a that's a big number. Yeah, John, and and I just wanted to, to yeah. jump onto that a little bit because you know Mike referenced the, the you know putting the organization to our approach to new technology, and I think you know what we've seen is that you know we've we've had success, and and you know Mike will talk a little bit more about that in Cavallo Ventures. Really happy with what we've seen working with you guys and others in kind of the new tech industry. But it's really, you know, the strategy is to design, you know, to, to advance our relationships with our customers and help our customers, you know, do their jobs better, get a return on their investment with us. Mm -hmm. As Mike said, you know, our success has been listening to our customers, understanding the marketplace. And so we've got lots of people out in the field who are talking to, talking to you know, farmers, growers, talking to, you know, folks in the livestock industry, aquaculture, et cetera. And they're understanding their problems well. We have our own approach to you know, in, in solving those problems that, with innovation. But mm -hmm. then we also have this relationship with Cavallo. And I think what we've really seen success is Cavallo's done great in the investments, but we also see that we're, we're improving our delivery of value to our customers mm -hmm. through that relationship we have with Cavallo Ventures. Mm -hmm. So it helps in productivity, et cetera. But it's really that combination between our operating units and Cavallo that I think is today's secret sauce. Right. Right. Yeah, actually, John, you know, you bring up a good point, and I probably ought to go back and, and do the math. But I would, I would bet about half the investments we've made at Cavallo originated from folks, whether in Canal or in our nutrition business or in our ag business, who sent it up to us and said, "You, you better check this out. There's real value here." Yeah, yeah. which great. is a huge advantage for us. Yeah, on certain things. And in terms of, um, you know, COVID, you know, we're all sitting in our homes, you've got 35,000 farmers to, to, to serve. 
you know, what have you, you know, how have you felt the impact of this and, and you know, what learnings, what, what do you think you're adapting and changing, you know, in your business? And, you know, maybe John, if you want to talk a little bit about that and, and maybe yeah. Mike, just in terms of any acceleration that you're seeing in particular technologies that you're looking at uh, from an investment perspective. Yeah, well, I think obviously we've, we've all learned to work in a totally different way than we did before. And I mean, not just, you know, folks who, Myself, I'm primarily office-based, travel a little bit, see customers and employees, but, uh, you know, even in the field, I mean, you know, we've got uh, certainly advanced our, our kind of no-touch deliveries um, and, uh, and you know, we think, okay, well, that's, that, that's a digital, that really advances the digital technologies available to us. Um, so, and I think we've seen that. So we're, we're talking today. Uh, through a digital technology, um, you know, perhaps in a you know, different time, we would have been sitting in a room in a seminar and maybe would have broadcast it elsewhere. So obviously we've got a global audience here, which is a lot easier than trying to do it in California somewhere. Um, and we've seen it as well. So of course we have the, the obvious thing everybody talks about and that talent is now more available anywhere in the world because of technology. You don't have to be physically located um, or co-located, although I think time zones help, you know, uh, similar time zone. But I think that's one thing. But in the field, we've definitely seen, a, and a lot of folks have said it, an acceleration of the transition to a more digital, a more complete digital relationship. You know, we've, we've always viewed, and we think it's been reinforced this year, that digital technologies are not going to replace kind of the human interaction, the touch that, that we excel at, and Wilbur Ellis, in, in our opinion, they're really going to complement and enable uh, and enhance that relationship and our ability to deliver value. And we've absolutely seen that this year. So what it'll do is from an efficiency point of view, like that no touch delivery, deliver it at this point and we can drop a pin on a map and you deliver at that point in the field, we don't need to see the customer, they don't need to see us. Good in COVID environment, actually more productive in, as well. So we kind of minimize the activity on really not value added stuff around where do you want it and how do you want it and making sure it's a physical delivery, allowing us to maximize the time we're doing on analyzing data from a farm field, leveraging our ag verdict uh, agronomic tool to deliver better solutions for our customers. So I think that's what's happened in COVID. It's really accelerated, uh, accelerated that. And Mike, I don't know if you've seen no, I think you said it well, and I, I think the the other area, and it was we had already focused on pre-COVID, is just the issue of labor in in agriculture, and I think it's just magnified that issue, and and also you know sort of reemphasized why we've looked at so many companies uh, in the robotics space to to do things more efficiently there. And, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, we see all the time, you know, we, we've, you know, over the last seven years, we've seen, I don't know, 5,000 startups. And I would tell you that the number one thing that all these startups are looking for is how do we get access to the farmer? How do we, what's our distribution strategy? Because it's very difficult to go, you know, farm by farm. It's very important to prove out your technology, but it's very hard to kind of build you know, a, a business like that. And obviously you've done that and built the trust of, of farmers around the world for a hundred years. You know, how, you know, what would be your advice to, to entrepreneurs in terms of either building their distribution strategy or approaching to, to build their business? Um, well, I think you said it well, you've, you've seen 5,000 pitches. Uh, you know, I probably have two and I bet you 4,995 of them, you know, the first thing out is, they're going to go direct to the grower and that they they don't need us. And so my first advice that they're going to come, you know, talking to us for help, you know, don't pitch us on putting us out of business and that we're not relevant. <laughs> That's generally the first thing I, I would say, you know, um, getting, I would think it is important to, to partner with the trusted advisors and the, the, people in the right area that the growers work with. It's easy to get to a lot of these big growers and the big farms, they're, they're set up, but to get to broad distribution, the growers are gonna to wanna to work with generally people they know and, and people that they trust until the technology is, is proven out and there's a, a comfort level with it. Okay. And I think there's, you know, <clears throat> I think part of the, uh, there's there's folks who come in, as Mike said, and they, you know, they're gonna put us out of business and all that kind of thing, which is, you know, Okay, 
that, that that's a good good idea. But you know what what I think people have been surprised by when they have that approach is, you know, we're not that's not intimidating to us. We're, we're our job is about getting this technology to our customers. That's what we think our job is. So we're really looking to figure out how do we help our customers excel at their business, and it may be introducing them to this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think we have value add to that, and I think our you know, invested, the companies we've invested in have seen that, that we help them more, more successful. And then, of course, they want to work more with us because, you know, then they're going to be, you know, it's kind of, kind of you know, snowballs from there. And so, you know, we're not, we're not sitting here saying we know everything. That's far from it. We're saying that we know a lot about how business today gets done have some insights into how it could be done better in the future. Let's have a conversation and then we can figure out how to best get this applied in the marketplace. Frequently that ends up with us having a role to play that's important and value added. And I think that works for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and I'd add on that, you know, being a hundred and years old, we want to innovate. We want to be at the, the cutting edge. We want to be that solution provider and bringing the technology, whether it's our customers in, in Asia or animal nutrition or, or in ag. So yeah. we, we think of that as a value add to us. So partnering with these companies and bringing it to our, our customers, we think enhances our position and differentiates us in the market versus you know our co-op customers and some of yeah. our other regional customers, regional competitors. And, and Mike, you know, we've we've been working together for you know three four years, and you know we, we see a lot of the startups. I know there's you know probably a handful of these that you've you've doubled down on in terms of from an investment perspective. Trace Genomics is one of those. Boost Biomes, Farmwise. Um, maybe just a double barred question, but you know, one, what's the best way for an entrepreneur or a startup to 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 come to you from an investment perspective? But then at the same time. What's the best way for that young company to engage with Wilbur Ellis? Is it kind of going through the investment door or the Wilbur Ellis door, or is it a combination of the two? It's really, I'd say, a combination of, of the two. You know, I mean, you, you bring up Trace Genomics, uh, for example, and that's been a great relationship there. You know, in the past few years, we really see the, the value of what that can bring, and, and we can and what that can enable and whether it's a shift to software chemistries and, and the things. And so with them, we really partnered and pulled uh, a lot of soil samples last year and this year. I mean, probably mm -hmm. close to four or 5,000 each year. But that in that case, they're a great example. We saw the value of where that could, where it was going and what it could lead to. And so in partnering with us, not just on the investment side, uh, you know, we do have limited resources. We can't engage with every company out there that has a moisture probe or a, a new twist on this. But if we can see where it's going to lead and what the value could be, not only to us, but really more importantly to, to our customer, uh, we generally will find the time uh, and resources to implement it. And to that degree, and back to just coming from an organizational standpoint, when we first started, it was a bit ha haphazard. And we learned that we put together a real dedicated business development group um, that works with Kavala Ventures. And then uh, they then take the, the companies that we're working with and implement them around the country where appropriate. And then on top of that, John, what do we have? 25 people who do just field technology. Yeah. Yeah. And so the fact that we have resources in place that are already supporting growers with field technology, uh, whether we've invested in it or not, we have the infrastructure in place to go there. And then on the boost biomes, you know, piece, we have an excellent R and D uh, opportunity, but we're, we're heavier, you know, what I would suggest on the, those who want to engage in us there, we're much better on commercializing products, things that are, you know, one or two years away from product launch uh, as a way, uh, as opposed to things that are, you know, three years from EPA approval, uh, and which is why Boost Biomes has been a good relationship. We've put them through, through our R&D efforts there, and we're hoping to launch a product with them soon. 
Brilliant. And I think uh, it's it's interesting. I think you know my my first response to that question would be it doesn't really matter. We're one company, mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. if a, if a startup or new tech comes into Cavallo, then Mike's going to vet it and then connect them with the right business development people in our operating divisions. Does it make sense? Or vice versa, the operating divisions are going to say, "Hey, Mike, this is a new thing. You might want to take a look at it." Uh, but the outcome of that isn't that everybody we work with in the field is an investment that Cavallo makes or that we only work in the field with investments that Cavallo makes. That's just not the case, right? I mean, Mike, we have a few hundred research trials, I think, every year that go out in the field. You might you might have a Cavallo investment on, I don't know, a tenth of those, 20%, I, I, I don't know. And the balance is being developed through the operating unit and the ag uh, division in that case. So it's not it's not a one-to-one correlation, but we are one company. And so whatever door you, you get to knock on a Wilbur Ellis, um, you know, you're going to have, uh, I think, the, all of Wilbur Ellis available to you. Obviously, you know, if it's venture and you're, or investment first, you know, Mike's the go-to person. Yeah, you know. I, w- I think that's a really good point. Even whether it's on the chemistry side or biological side or data and, and technology, I, I would think most of the companies w- we're working with in some form or fashion, we don't have an in- investment in, but it is, but we do take, we do take a very organized approach to, or at least we, we wanted to, because I, 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 as I mentioned earlier in this talk, really in 2015 or 2016, our guys were getting overwhelmed and it was, it was really, you know, we were going an inch deep with a thousand companies. And so we, we did put some organization to it. Yeah. Well, and also from our point of view, it's been great to be able to kind of work with you here, you know, because we've, you know, we take 500 companies, bring it down to the best 10 and being able to get those companies with you and, and in front of the, the Wilbur Ellis, uh, you know, teams is, is really been great from our point of view to be able to have that relationship. So it's been for us, we we really, it's really been a big value add uh, for, for what we do. Maybe one last question before we go to the polls, because I, I, I and, and it's not, it's our polls, not the political polls. Um, the, uh, you know, the future, you know, um, maybe John and Mike, John, you know, what's next for, for, for Wilbur Ellis or what are you looking out to? You know, I, I, I feel like on one hand, you, you know, you started in the fish meal mm-hmm. business and now you're going into aqua is are you going yeah. back to the future or it's coming full circle and, it is going full circle. and maybe the second part of that question maybe mike maybe from an investment perspective are, are there kind of key hot buttons or key themes that you see in the future and it might be any companies that are out there uh might be able to uh connect with you john well yeah i mean it's a great question and i you know i think we like I think we like where we are in the industries we serve, and you could tell that it's it's at the roots of the company. It's been our it's been our kind of our focus for a hundred years, providing essentials for the world to thrive. So I I, I don't think you're going to see us go into you know scoop up some distressed hospitality uh, assets or something, right? So we're gonna we're gonna stay you know close to our knitting and and you know crop agriculture, animal nutrition, uh, food ingredients, especially chemicals. That that space I think is where we think is our sweet spot <clears throat> but you know it, it will they're sustainable businesses right so we've been in them for 100 years we think 100 years from now those those businesses will be key and important uh to provide the essentials of the world to thrive uh, but i think that sustainability aspect of those businesses is something we think uh will be more and more about our future we've always been um you know focused on how do you help how do we help our customers and in our industry to be sustainable, right? If you don't have a high return on investment, or at least a, you know, a sufficient one, you're not gonna stay in business. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're you know, detrimentally impacting the environment and communities you work in, you're not gonna stay in business. Yeah. And so that I think is what we see ramping up as a need and an opportunity for mm-hmm. us uh, as, a, as an industry and us as a company to mm-hmm. you know, continue to invest in sustainability of the businesses and the industries that we serve. So I think you can look for us to continue to be bold and leverage the secret sauce we've had over the number of years. You know, our investment in nature is a play towards sustainability. I mean, the liquid fertilizer, they, they provide much more sustainable, less runoff, et cetera. Some of the investments that Mike will talk about, I think is directed towards that. So I think you continue to see us look like we have over a hundred years and, and continue to be bold. Uh, and leading in innovation in the industries that we serve. 
Thanks, John. Mike, uh, where, are you, uh, where are you going to be placing the big bets? Well, I, I think John summed it up well. And, you know, as you, you think about things like nature's, to me, that is a big bet. It's, and it is about sustainability, but it's also a huge deal about precision ag, right? It, 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 nature's is all about precision ag when you, when you get down to how they're, they're doing it. And, you know, sustainability, I guess I look at it, it's the same thing for me, but I look at it as, a lot of its operational efficiencies as yeah. well, whether it's our own internal operational efficiency, but more importantly, our customers. And in the case of growers, how can they do more with less? And how can they, you know, use less chemistry, use use less fertilizer, get the same or get or get higher yields? And that that achieves that sustainability goal. So how can they use data to to help get there? How can they use less water? and it's an operational efficiency play. And then I think the, the other areas that we're really at the Kavala level focused on are innovations in aquaculture, you know, coming full circle on the fish meal. Aquaculture is a big, big deal for us. Um, and then with our business in Asia, really healthy, natural ingredients into food uh, and into personal care are, are really big areas of focus. Um, because that's just the way things are are trending, yeah. Uh, and that's what what folks want. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, maybe Jess, you want to show the polls, and we'll see uh, what way people are are, uh, are voting here. And uh, the question that we had asked people was: To what extent do you agree or disagree that human relationships, interactions with farmers and trusted advisors will be displaced by digital technology? So I'm, I'm somehow I'm not surprised. Uh, percent of people are disagreed, but there is a split. Yeah, um, and some people there's 27 percent uh, agree. So, and I, I'm yeah. So what what do you think about that, John, Mike? Surprise. Well, you know, like uh, yeah, uh, it's it's, a, it's kind of uh, broad across the way. People are either unsure or completely agree or disagree. But you know, I, I said it earlier. I think that. Um, you know, digital tech, I think, you know, as, as uh, somebody says in technology, all these software, digital technologies tend to be kind of overestimated the impact in the short term and underestimated in the long term. But, mm -hmm. but, you know, the way we see it is that digital technology is going to enhance the interaction, human interaction, and focus it on the creative aspect and, and leveraging what a human can do best, right? So we'll automate some of the operational things with digital technology, which seen and then we'll allow the human we'll, we'll kind of increase the human interaction the value of that so i, I think that's the way it's going to play it out it had play out it has in other industries uh, and i think we'll see that play out that way in uh, in the ones that we serve yeah I, I i would look at it this way and i used to use this slide in presentations i would would give you know and i'd show a, a doctor from the 50s and he's got a stethoscope and now you show a doctor from today, you know, with a uh, MRI machine, right? The, the MR, MRI didn't replace the doctor, but it sure made them a lot better. And I'd much rather have the, the doctor with the MRI. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of these tools yeah. are going to make, make it better uh, and better advice and, and enabled that way. But you're not necessarily getting rid of that human relationship. Yeah. I think I, we, we had a, our son had a little... Uh, incident uh, during the weekend we had the doctor by zoom so maybe you know the, uh, you the next there'll still be a person to person mm -hmm. uh the, the just the second question was um what do you believe is the biggest challenge is preventing farms from adopting technology and uh th this one is, is really interesting and I'm, I'm and i'm not surprised and i think mike you hit on it a couple of times there earlier in our conversation you know like we hear a lot about 5g and you know data coherence and regulation but learning curve you know kind of training practices understanding trying to navigate through all these different solutions is still uh, a big challenge yeah i think that i think that's right i mean you know mike like mike said getting bombarded you know not only where our people getting that but you can imagine how much the farmer themselves the growers getting bombarded even more and uh, and then tends to look to folks like us to say, hey, you know, what are you thinking? What are you seeing going on? And what, you know, what, what should I try? What, did any of these make sense? Yeah. Um, 
And so how do you, how do you kind of sort through that? And I think, you know, by and large in, in agriculture, they rely on trusted advisors, somebody they think, you know, is, has their interest at heart um, yeah. to help them kind of sort through it. Uh, yeah. And so I, I agree. I think that is probably the biggest barrier and something that you know, we're focused on through our efforts, both mm -hmm. in Volo and in general, uh, to try and help our, our customers, you know, make the best choices they can. Yep. Thanks, John. And maybe we'll go to the Q&A for, for the audience. Um, just uh, if you can get that in front of you there with the Q&A uh, yep, yep. button there. So the, I see the top question from uh, Ragvinder Reki uh, and my Irish accent. Hopefully I, I pronounced that okay. Uh, considering your 100 year history, things change. How do you how do you figure out? Hang on, I lost the question. Uh, hang on. Uh, how do you figure out what is the next thing? Well, um, you know, I, I think that uh, one, of, one of the things we've done is establish Cavallo Ventures to answer that question, right? Yeah. But, but Mike said it before, uh, you know, in his intro, <clears throat> it's listening to our customers. I mean, that, that's the first thing is, is, yeah. is going out and understanding what are the pain points our customers have and, and, you know, what are the most important ones to work on and how can we help solve that? <clears throat> and then, you know, one option is to go out and, you know, pay attention to these new technologies. A lot of people who are developing them are trying to, you know, are trying to understand those pain points as well. Yeah. I think that's probably the top. And Mike, I don't know if you say Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely, I mean, that's how we've done it over a hundred years is, is really listening to our customers and, and, what they're saying. And then, then I think there's also a, a big piece of making sure that we know what's going on in the industry. We, uh, in the case of ag, we know what's happening in, in Europe and thinking, okay, that could happen over here. It's listening to, you know, our customers in Asia and applying the learnings from these other, these other markets and other business segments that we're, we're in, uh, globally. Thanks, Mike. Uh, question from Luis Hernandez. Um, what are some of the initiatives that Wilbur Ellis is taking to fend off the tighter margins in the ag chem retail industry? Well, the, the margins are getting tighter. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, margins, margins kind of follow value. And, um, and so our, our perspective is that uh, as long as we continue to add value to our customer base, we will be able to be profitable. Uh, that's been the case from day one, 100 years ago, uh, till today. So, so all we try and do is figure out how do we continue to add value to our customers to help them make them more successful. And by doing so, we're going to get a we're going to get a fair return on that. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you, you know, of course, we got to be more efficient, right? We got to make sure that we're not being you know, sloppy with how we do things or spending too much money in order to deliver that value. So, I mean, that's on us and that's, you know, to, to make sure we're bringing fair value to our customers, we have to do that well. Yeah. But, you know, as long as we bring that value, then we'll be successful. So what do we do? We yeah. already talked about it. We invest in bringing that value. We invest in, you know, product research. We invest in field research. We invest in field technologies. We invest in, you know, new ventures, uh, you know, through Kavala Ventures. Mm -hmm. So I think we're doing all of those things and things we talked about today to bring value to our customers. And therefore, you know, we'll figure out, uh, kind of the market will figure out how, we're prof how we get profit from doing it. Great, thank thanks, John. I have a question from uh, Arpin So Parker. Uh, how does Wilbur Ellis think about regenerative and organic agriculture movement? Uh, uh, Mike, you got a comment on that? I think we're all for it. I mean, I, it, you know, back to our our customers, we don't take a position on how they, they want to farm, particularly with the heavy footprint on the West Coast. We have a huge organic business and it's really important to us and we're ready to support them. Uh, in terms of regenerative ag, you know, I think that's also one of the things that we started Cavallo for is we see what the public wants and where consumers are wanting things to go. Uh, 
whether it happens just through that kind of demand or through regulation down the road, that's sort of one of the things we're preparing for is how do we help enable that and, and move that direction. So I'm. No, I think you're right, Mike. I think we're, we're you know, we wouldn't uh, fight it. Yeah, the sustainability side is, you know, certainly we want to yeah. we want to make sure that we're understanding how do we make sure our industry is sustainable long term. Mm -hmm. It's critical, essential for the world. So, you know, we want to make sure that it has as, as, as little impact as possible on, on, on the world. But, you know, at the same time is highly productive. Right. So right. so it's a balance there to make sure that we're highly productive and, you know, kind of minimize that impact. Um, you know, Mike said, uh, you know, organic, we certainly have a decent, you know, pretty big business on that. And, and there's an example of an investment that Mike's engaged in, but it's not a Cavallo investment where we're, you know, we're bringing some organic fertility, novel organic fertility to the marketplace. So, you know, I think we're, you know, we're investing along with our customers and trying to figure out how to, how do we maximize productivity and minimize impact. Yeah. And I would, would also add, but that doesn't mean we'd like to see the existing synthetic chemistry off the market. We want to see them used yeah. responsibly. You know yeah. what? They work, uh, and yeah. we'd like we'd like them to stay around. And that means they should be used responsibly and in a good way. Yeah. And that and that will keep them around longer. Yeah. We're very much in favor of doing doing that and doing things the right way. Frequently, the the most productive approach, right? To yeah. make sure that it's used properly, but when used responsibly. Highly effective and highly productive. Okay. Yeah. And one last question, which I think is a fantastic. I love this question. Uh, it's about our next generation uh, coming up. Brittany O'Brien, uh, as an agribusiness student going into the workforce, what would you like us to see the next generation achieve? And what classes would you recommend studying in order to do so? So maybe it's a little bit of advice for the younger generation. Mike, you have thoughts on that? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I should, I got a, two high school kids uh, <laughs> doing it now, so I, I probably should have a better answer. Um, you know, as I look, the, the group that we're bringing on, John, and we, and we have a, a pretty dynamic group of folks we've hired in the last uh, yeah. four or five years. Uh, I'm always amazed, you know, just how quick and good they are with social media, uh, which, yeah, so I'm maybe not answering the question, but I'm, it's amazing that sort of impact. Um, and I, I've also, despite what you read about, uh, you know, how the, the press talks about it, I, I think the work ethic I, from what I've seen has been, been tremendous. But, uh, you know, as I look at what I'd, give as advice. I mean, a lot of it's uh, really, and, and, well, and I do see this with my kids, how do you give presentations? How do you effectively communicate ideas? How can you mm -hmm. stand up in, in, in front of uh, groups and talk? And I, I still think that's probably a, a, a lacking skill that I see out there a bit. But overall, yeah. probably, I think I've been in you know, we, we have our, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but they, next gen. Next gen, thank you that come in and, and we, it's a three-year program that we put, put them through and uh, we run them through. So financial training uh, on how to read a PL, how to put together right. a PL. Um, we put them through agronomic training. What are some of the other courses that we run our, our next? Year? Well, and it's also kind of like career planning, right? right. We give them career planning. And, and it, it, you know, Mike, that's a great point because where I was going to go with it is, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned, right? We're looking for people who have a degree in agronomy or agribusiness, et cetera. And I would get as broad an education as you can mm -hmm. because we're going to come in, like Mike said, we're going to come in and our job is to kind of take you to that next level skills and abilities that meet the needs of our company and your career. So, you know, you'd almost rather not have somebody be so specialized because then we're just going to say, okay, well, you fit into this spot and not necessarily everywhere else. And we kind of, we, we like to mold our folks to be the Wolverellas folks and, you know, put them, put them where we think they need. And that the breadth of education is more likely 
beneficial in that situation. Yeah. But yeah. we run, I don't know how many people through that every year. 75 it, people. We had a, it, 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 I, I don't know if anyone who else in the industry does it, but it really is the how do you read a PL? Why does it matter if inventory sits there for 540 <laughs> days? What does working capital mean? You know, and, and uh, uh, things like that, as well as the agronomic piece. Yeah. And so it, it's a uh, yeah. it's a three year program that yeah. we put people through. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Listen, I mean, thank you for your feedback on that. I mean, it's, it's such an important question for all of us, you know, for the future generation, I think kind of hearing that, you know, having a domain expertise, but kind of having a, a T type, you know, get, get, yeah. go across, you know, different areas. Mm -hmm. And I think Mike, you said it great. I mean, like being able to present and being able yeah. to communicate is probably one of the things that I think every kid on the planet should should start mm -hmm. with. And uh, great, uh, great advice there. Gentlemen, John, Mike, really appreciate your time today, sharing the insights, the learnings from the last 100 years. And congratulations. Uh, I Thank mean, you. it's, uh, I mean, that's a phenomenal achievement uh, by a family business. And uh, we wish you all the best. Um, please invite me to the big party in June. <laughs> I'll bring some <laughs> uh, to be able to celebrate with you. And, uh, and again, thank you for, for sharing your insights. Uh, again, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. And maybe just in, uh, in, in, in wrapping up here, uh, we have uh, on November 19th, we'll have a, a great session. One of the biggest deals that have been has been done this year in terms of boat investment, but probably more important for the future of agriculture and the future of indoor and specifically vertical farming is the partnership between Driscoll's and Plenty. We're gonna give you an inside view into how all that happened and where it's going. Uh, we were delighted to, to work with both companies uh, in helping uh, support and make that happen. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I hope you really enjoyed uh, the conversation and learning more about Wilbur Ellis and Cavalla Ventures. And we look forward to um, staying in tune with you over the next few, few months. And again, thank you to John and Mike. And I'd also like to thank my team, Jess, Helen, and all the team for being able to support and put on the, the, the program today. So thank you very much. Be safe and uh, hope to see everybody very soon. Take care.